we're going to get something brand new from the Word of God. Michael, this is for you and Joanna. For you and Joanna. Hey, Rick. Hey. I'm sorry you're going to hear the same thing tonight. But tomorrow night's going to be something new. Hey. Amen. I just saw Pastor Rick and Linda Shark here with us tonight. We were with them in Spokane on Sunday. But open your Bible to John chapter 6, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. John chapter 6. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for tonight. We thank you for the wonderful word of God. Lord, we ask you for a revival of the Bible in the United States. Holy Spirit, you're the one that authored this word. And tonight we ask you to pick us up and to transport us into Scripture. Let us see this word, feel this word, and be changed by it. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So tomorrow night we're going to do how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. But tonight we're going to begin in John chapter 6 and verse 1. And in John chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover feast of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6, And this he said to prove him. Everybody say proof. This he said to prove him, for he himself knew already what he would do. But let's go back to verse 1, and today we're going to dissect these verses and see what they have to say to us. John chapter 6, verse 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, that's also very interesting. I'll just make a point. Sometimes this is called the Sea of Tiberias. Sometimes it's called the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes it's called the Sea of Gennesaret. And that's very important because what it's called tells us when this was written. And at this particular time, this was written during the reign of Tiberius. So this was also called the Sea of Tiberius. And the Bible tells us, a great multitude followed him. Well, when you read this in the, great te- the Greek text, the word multitude is the Greek word oculos, and the word oculos by itself would be sufficient to describe a massive multitude. This word oculos really describes a mob of people. But in this particular verse, the word polus is added to it, and the word polus is a magnifier or a modifier of the word oculus, which means this wasn't just a big mob or a massive group. This word polus means a massive, massive, massive multitude. And in fact, this was the biggest multitude that had ever followed Jesus up until that time. And the Bible says this massive multitude followed him, And the Greek tense for followed means to habitually follow or literally they followed and 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 and kept on following and kept on following and kept on following. And the Greek implies that every day of Jesus' ministry at this particular moment, the multitude was getting larger and larger and larger and larger. And that is why it was not enough to use the word oculus, which describes a mob, but the Holy Spirit modified it with the word polus. It was a massive, massive, massive multitude. And this multitude was so addicted to the ministry of Jesus that they would not leave him. If Jesus turned north, they all turned north. If Jesus turned west, they all turned west. If Jesus turned east, if Jesus turned south, it didn't matter where Jesus went. This multitude followed and followed and kept on following and kept on following. And every day, the multitude kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It was polus oculus, a massive, massive, massive multitude. Now, what also is very interesting 
is that when you come to John chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Jesus passed over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and he came into the region of Capernaum. Well, Capernaum was the city of Jesus. In fact, even during Jesus' lifetime, while Jesus was living in Capernaum in Peter's house, in fact, today, if you visit the ruins of Capernaum, which are very well preserved, you can visit the actual house where Peter lived. There's no doubt about it because it was identified in the third century by the grandchildren of people who remembered their parents, and their parents told them where Peter lived. In the third century, they uncovered it, and there was a church that had been built as a reminder in the house of Peter. It's about 10 or 15 meters from the synagogue. And the synagogue is where Jesus worked his first miracle when he came into Capernaum. The Bible tells us he entered into the synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, there was a man with an unclean spirit that cried out. All of that happened in the synagogue. That synagogue is still there in Capernaum. Well, why did Jesus move to Capernaum? This is very interesting. Jesus was naturally from where? Nazareth. Why didn't he base his ministry in Nazareth? He was from Nazareth. His parents lived in Nazareth. His relatives lived in Nazareth or in Sephoris. Why didn't he base his ministry in Nazareth? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4 that the people rejected him. They were offended when he picked up the scroll and he read from Isaiah chapter 61 and said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. It made them livid. How dare he say he is the Messiah? And they rejected him. But Nazareth was in the middle of nowhere. It was a bedroom community. There were no major roads to Nazareth. It would be impossible to have a ministry in Nazareth and affect a nation. And when that door closed, and it did close, Jesus began to seek a place to establish his ministry. And you have to understand that everything God does, God does very strategically. God doesn't do anything by accident. And when Jesus came to Capernaum, Capernaum was a border town. In fact, you couldn't even enter that area of Israel without first passing through the city of Capernaum. So a lot of people were coming into Capernaum. This was a very strategic town. Not only that, Capernaum was a very rich town. There was a lot of money in Capernaum. If you have in your mind that Jesus lived in some little poor community, remove that picture. Capernaum was a very wealthy, well-to-do fishing community. And in fact, it was so well-to-do that the Bible tells us a nobleman lived there. A nobleman from the Greek word basilikos, it describes somebody that is royal. Royalty lived in the town. It had a massive synagogue. In fact, it had the finest synagogue in the whole of Galilee. The remnants of it, again, are still there today. It is just exquisite. And not only that, Capernaum was the city responsible for collecting taxes from the whole of Galilee. So there was a lot of money in Capernaum. That's why Jesus met Matthew, the tax collector, in the city of Capernaum. So when Jesus chose Capernaum to establish his ministry, he chose a place that was well-connected to other countries. He chose a place where royalty lived. He chose a place where there was a lot of religious instruction. There was a lot of money in Capernaum, and not only that, Capernaum was the largest port on the Sea of Galilee, but more important than any of that, more important than any of that, running right along the side of Capernaum, was a highway. And the highway went all the way from Damascus, which is the oldest city in the history of the world, all the way through Jerusalem to Cairo. It was called the Via Maris. It was the most important highway in the entire nation of Israel. So if you were in Damascus and wanted to go to Jerusalem or travel further south to Cairo, guess what? You had to take the Via Maris, which meant you had to pass through Capernaum, or if you were in Cairo and you wanted to go east to Damascus, you had to take the Via Maris, which means you're going to pass through Capernaum, and Capernaum was about halfway. And because it was about halfway, there were hotels in Capernaum, there were shops in Capernaum, there were restaurants in Capernaum, and Capernaum was nestled right on the banks of the Sea of Galilee, where the view was beautiful and the breezes were wonderful. It was a tourist attraction. 
So people were coming to Capernaum and leaving Capernaum. There was a flow of people coming in and out of Capernaum. And when Jesus chose Capernaum, he strategically chose a location where he could be in one spot and would touch the entire world without going anywhere because people were coming in and people were going out. There was a flow of people. This was very strategic. But because of the miracles that Jesus did, even in his own lifetime, the city of Capernaum, while Jesus was living there for about three years, during his own lifetime, he became the number one tourist attraction in Capernaum, and Capernaum was nicknamed the city of Jesus. The city of Jesus. Well, what do you think it would be like if Jesus lived in Tacoma? If there were miracles just abounding, he would be the number one tourist attraction in the city. And people were flooding into Capernaum because of Jesus. And now we find that in Capernaum and around Capernaum, the multitudes are growing and growing and growing and growing. Verse 2 says, and a great multitude, polus, oculus, a massive, massive, massive multitude followed him. And now you know the Greek means habitually kept on following and following and following and following and following him. And what does the rest of the verse say? Because, in Greek it is the word hoti, it gives us a purpose clause, or now he's going to tell us why the multitudes were following because they saw they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Well, how many miracles was he doing? The answer is in this word, they saw. The words they saw in Greek agrees with the word followed. They followed and followed and kept on following and kept on following and kept on following, habitually following Hoti because, the Greek agrees, they kept on seeing and kept on seeing and kept on seeing and habitually kept on seeing and kept on seeing and kept on seeing his miracles which he performed on them that were diseased. Which means if you were with Jesus, there was always something to see and there was always something to hear. Activity was happening all the time. They were seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing. And the word seeing is a translation of the Greek word harao, which means to see, to observe, to scrutinize. This was the most marvelous theater that had ever entered Galilee. It was a show like no other show they had ever seen. The Bible says they saw his miracles, which he did. The word did is important. You say, is he really going to teach on the word did? Yes, I am. The word did is the Greek word poieo. The word poieo, Pastor Jan can tell you. It's a very important New Testament word. It's a creative word. It doesn't just mean to do something. It means to creatively do something, to release creative power. It's the same word which is used in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 when the Bible says God has created us as his workmanship in Christ Jesus. It means when we were born again, God released all of his creative juices, all of his creative energy. We are marvelous masterpieces. That's who we are once Christ comes into our life. It's creative power, poyeo. Well, because this word poyeo is used here, translated did, Mm. It means Jesus wasn't just healing migraine headaches. Poyeo, which he did, creative, creative power. It means eyes were being put where there was no eye and arms were growing where there was no arm. These were miracles of a creative nature. Well, now wait. You don't read a lot about those creative miracles in the Gospels. That's okay. You can't read about everything Jesus did in the Gospels. He did too many things. That's why when you come to the very last chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 25, the very last statement that John writes is if we wrote down everything that Jesus did. You know what that word if means? The Greek case means, if it were possible, of course it's not. But let's just say we tried. That's a literal translation. 
The world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Well, how many books do we have about the life of Jesus? How many Gospels do we have? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, let's talk about that. Four Gospels. Four Gospels. We know that Jesus lived in his ministry three and a half years. But if you begin with his birth, his birth, and go all the way to his ascension, 33 years, of those 33 years, how many actual days do you think are actually recorded in the four Gospels? Out of 33 years, how many actual days? I'm going to give you two numbers. At a maximum, at a maximum, 53 days. Most scholars agree, probably 27. So in the four Gospels, if you chronologically put it all together, it's somewhere between 27 and 53, I believe 27 to 33 days of Jesus' life is actually recorded in the Gospels. It took four Gospels to write what Jesus did, let's say in about 30 days, but the problem is we don't even have one accurate picture of one complete day. All we have is snapshots, fragments of what he did in little pieces of those days. And it took four Gospels to write it. And that is why John said, if, of course it's not possible, but let's just say we tried. If you could write everything that he did, the world could not contain the books that would be written. That is why we find in John chapter 6, verse 2, the crowd was following and following and following because they were habitually seen and seen and seen and seen and seen and seen. And in fact, if you look at the four Gospels and discover what Jesus had already done in his ministry from the beginning of his ministry in Capernaum to John chapter 6, he has already healed Thousands of people. Thousands. It's amazing, isn't it? That's the Jesus that we serve. And by the way, the Bible says he's the yesterday, same yesterday, today, and forever, which means what he did is what he does. He is still in this business today. And the multitude was seen and seen and seen. His miracles, which he, Poyeo, was creatively doing on them that disease, were diseased. The word on is the word epi. Oh, several words could have been used here, but the word epi is important because the word epi means up on, almost like an invasion of power. And we find that when Jesus' ministry began, there was literally an invasion of divine power from heaven that came epi up on the whole of Galilee. They were invaded by a visitation of God. Even the word diseased is important from the Greek word asthenio. It describes those that are sick in any way, those that are bedfast, homebound, and it even if describes those that are financially destitute. And here we find what sickness does. Sickness is such a thief. It steals your time. It steals your attention. It steals your money. Sickness will leave you destitute. That's what it comes. And Jesus came to attack it. And when the Bible says, which he did, the word epi, it means there was an invasion of power upon those that were destitute, financially strapped, anybody that had been afflicted. And that's what happens when God's power shows up. God's power shows up to do something. But then look at verse 3. What does verse 3 say? It says, in Jesus, what? Went up unto a mountain, and there he sat. The Greek word actually says he reclined. And I like that. Because it tells me even Jesus needed a break. Everybody needs a break from time to time. 
Now, we don't know how he got the break. Because the multitudes are following and following and following and following and following him. But in some way, Jesus has designed a plan to escape from the multitude, which means it's all right for preachers to go out the back door sometimes. (laughs) Amen. But now Jesus is on the top of the mountainside. The Greek says reclining with his disciples. These were not only his disciples, they were his best friends. They were living life together. They were enjoying each other. So Jesus is now on the top of the mountain. The top of the mountain is covered with green grass. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And from where they are, they're laying there, they're looking out, and they can see the Sea of Galilee in front of them. They see the wonderful green grass. They can feel the breezes coming off of the lake. And if they look down the mountain, in front of them at the bottom of the mountain is the Via Maris, the big highway. And that's important because the next verse says what? It says the Passover was nigh. Do you see that? Now, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't waste any words. If there's something in the Bible, it's there for a reason. God really likes to use everything well. He doesn't waste any space. So if it's there, it's there for a reason. Everyone in Jerusalem, by law, by tradition, in Israel, went to Jerusalem at the time of Passover. Everybody without exception. So if you lived in Bethlehem, you went to Jerusalem. If you lived in Nazareth, you went to Jerusalem. If you lived in the Sephardus, if you lived in Damascus, it didn't matter where you lived, you by custom, by law, by tradition, you gathered up your kids, your mother, your daddy, your grandpa, your grandma, everybody went to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. This was something you taught, you ingrained it in your kids. So now Jesus is reclining on the mountain with his disciples. He looks down at the Via Maris, the highway. And from where he is, he sees all the people from the north are on that highway. The highway is packed with people that are walking in one direction. They're all headed to the city of Jerusalem because the Passover was nigh. They were all on the way to Jerusalem when somehow somebody in the crowd discovered that Jesus is on the top of that mountain. So the whole crowd turns, departs the Via Maris, leaves the highway, and they begin walking up the side of the mountain. And that leads us to the next verse. Look at what it says. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and saw a great company come unto him. Great company, again, is the same Greek phrase, polis oculus, a massive, massive, massive company come unto him. The word unto is even important because it probably tells us what Jesus felt when he saw the crowd. It's the word pros. The word pros means directly. In other words, Jesus knew This big crowd, they were not coming to see Peter, James, or John. They were all pros. They were coming directly toward him. He knew what he was seeing was headed in his direction. And when he saw all these people, the Bible says, He saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? The word buy is a Greek word, agorizo. It means to buy. It's also the word for the marketplace. So if you're going to translate it correctly, Jesus really asked them. I'm going to paraphrase it, but this is what it means. Hey, guys, are there any stores up here where we can buy some bread to feed all these folks? Well, of course there was no store. There was no bread. They were on the top of a mountain place in a remote location, and Jesus is asking this question. Why did he ask it? Verse 6 tells us, and this he said to do what? Prove him. Everybody say prove. For he himself knew what he was going 
to do. He already knew what he was going to do, so why did he ask the question? He didn't need to ask the question. If he already knew what he was going to do, why did he ask the question? To do what? To prove him. That word prove is a form of the Greek word perazzo. It means to test something in order to reveal its deficiency. To reveal its deficiency. So Jesus was looking to reveal something in the disciples. So hold on. Why was the crowd following him? Because they were seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing the miracles which he did creatively upon. It was an invasion of power. It was an amazing heaven sent performance. Well, if the massive, massive multitudes were seeing what he did, that's why they were following him from a distance. How much better had the disciples seen the signs and wonders? They were on the stage. They were the ushers. They were the catchers. They were inviting the next person up for prayer. They were working with Jesus. They saw the miracles, touched the miracles, felt the power, saw it firsthand. They were closer than anybody else. And you would think after everything they have seen Jesus do already in this moment of need, you would think after everything they've seen and everything they've heard, they would have said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but we know you. You can do anything. But now they're confronted with something they've never seen Jesus do. And rather than move into faith, they moved into panic. And they went on a food search. Now, I would think that they would have said, Lord, we don't know how you're going to do it, but Lord, we've seen you walk on water. We've seen you turn water into wine. We've seen you raise the dead. Jesus, we trust you. God, we know you can do anything. That is not what they did. They immediately went on a food search, trying somehow to solve the problem by themselves. One question from Jesus revealed after everything they had seen, they still had room to come up a notch. And that is the value of Jesus asking you important questions. When Jesus asks you to give a gift like you've never given before, his question will reveal who you really are in your faith. If Jesus asks you to do something you've never done before, that question will reveal where are you really in your faith. I'm telling you, one question from Jesus, it suddenly cuts away all the imagery. You find out who you really are. I can't help but go back to me and Denise. Back in those early years, we were traveling all over the United States with our sons, preaching, preaching 450 times a year. 450 times a year. I mean, Jan, just do the mathematics. There's not that many days in a year. We were living in church and driving to our meetings. Working, preaching, God was moving. My books began selling. From 1988 to 1991, we sold a million copies of my books. I mean, that's hard to do today. It was miraculous what was taking place. And you know what I was primarily teaching everywhere I went? Obey God, do whatever God tells you to do. And then one day God asked me, Will you move your family from Tulsa, Oklahoma to the Soviet Union? Well, it's so easy to tell other people to obey God, but when God asks you, suddenly it reveals where you are in your own faith. And I struggled. Denise and I just bought a new house. We live two blocks from Brother Hagen. 
We lived about three blocks from T.L. Osborne, about four blocks from Oral, and Carmen lived no so far from us. I mean, we were just living in our dreams. What a location. Things were happening. Things were being blessed. And then Jesus said, I'd like to reassign you. And at first, I didn't tell what Denise, what God said to me. Because I knew if I didn't tell anybody, I could disobey, and nobody knew I was disobedient. <laughs> you know, sometimes you've got to warm up to obedience. How many of you know what I'm talking? You've got to warm up to your obedience sometimes. Finally, I found myself among a group of missionaries, and I was the special speaker was a bunch of missionaries, the very first group, the very first group that was moving to the Soviet Union. I hadn't told anybody what God had said to me. I was resisting. I knew I could just hope that it would just go away. You know, sometimes you hope the voice of God just goes away, but it wouldn't go away. And when I was in that meeting in the midst of all those missionaries, I suddenly was inspired. And before I knew what I was doing, I came to the pulpit, took the microphone, and said, tonight I'm announcing that God has called me to the Soviet Union. I came back to my seat and sat down and thought, stupid idiot, what in the world have you done? Now you've announced it. If you don't do it, they're going to say you're disobedient or you're so flaky you don't know the voice of God. Now you are trapped. I went back to my hotel room that night, the entire night. No exaggeration here. I was on my knees in front of the toilet, holding the toilet bowl, vomiting the entire night, saying to God, what will happen if I obey you? Just one question revealed I had a deficit of trust. I was so trapped by the will of God. I called Bob Yandian who's so logical. I knew he would tell me it was foolish. I said, Bob, tell me, what do you think of this? He said, you know, Rick, I don't understand why, but I really believe this is the will of God for your life. I was so sorry I had that talk with him. <laughs> and finally, I said to Denise, honey, this is it. This is the last test. I'm going to ask our kids what they think about this. And if they don't agree, I'm taking it as a sign from God that we're not supposed to go. You see, one question from Jesus revealed me. Here I was telling everybody else how to walk in faith and how to do what God tells you to do, but now God was asking me to do something he had never asked before. I was so exposed. So we put our kids on the couch in our house by Kenneth Hagin and Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne. Paul was held. Eight, Philip was six, Joel was two. Eight, six, and two. And I'm going to let them advise me on what we're supposed to do. So Denise and I stood in front of them, and this is literally what I said. Boys, we're thinking about moving to the Soviet Union. Do you know what that means? No, Daddy. They didn't know what that was. I said, the Soviet Union is a country that kills Christians. <laughs> Do you understand? Yes, Daddy. I said, mothers and daddies are sent to prison and children become orphans. If we move to the Soviet Union, we could be killed, we could be sent to prison, you could become orphans. We don't know what will happen to us when we get there. Do you understand? They said, yes, Daddy. I said, all right. I need to hear what you think. 
And Philip, who had been hearing me teach all over the United States, obey God. <laughs> Philip looked at me. He raised his hand. I said, yes, Philip. He said, well, Daddy, you got to die sometime. <laughs> you might as well die doing what God told you to do. It'll be all right. And that was the final moment when I surrendered. I said, okay, we're going to go. But one question revealed me. And I have to tell you that as you walk with God, the questions don't stop coming. When you finish one assignment, another question comes. You know why? Because God is interested in changing you from glory to glory. He wants to prove you. And by the way, he already knows you. He doesn't need to provide the test for him. He already knows about your deficit. He wants you to find out about your deficit. He already knew that about me. I needed to see where I needed to grow. So now the disciples are in panic. Food. How are we going to feed this crowd? They're combing the side of the mountain looking for food. And one of the disciples says, Lord, if we had 200 penny worth of bread, look at it, the next verse, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. A penny worth of bread is worth denarius. A denarius was one entire day wage. It was the equivalent of saying, Lord, if we had 200 days of salary, even that would not buy enough bread that every one of them could take a little. The Greek describes a fragment. This must have been a big crowd. I'm going to tell you how big in just a minute. Look at the next verse. Andrew said, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, and then he adds this last statement, what are, what are they among so many? Well, this is so preposterous. Here is Oculus Polis, massive, 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 massive multitude, biggest crowd Jesus has ever seen. And Andrew comes up with this solution, and that shows you what our flesh can come up with. Anything our flesh comes up with really is ridiculous. If you're not moving to the miraculous realm, you'll produce something really stupid, and that's what he did. Lord, there is a lad here. Well, normally the word lad would be the word pais, which describes a little boy, but this is the word piderion, which takes a pious and makes it even smaller. This is a very little boy, probably between four and seven, four and six years old. So now, as they're working the crowd, Andrew sees a little boy about to eat. He says, don't eat that food. We need that food. He gathers up this child, runs to the top of the hill, and the little boy is plopped in front of someone he's never seen before who's looking at him, wondering, will you give me your food? What do you think was going through the mind of that child? And the Bible says that he had five barley loaves and two small fishes. Well, the word barley loaf is the word krithinos. It's the word for a barley cracker. And because it was so popular, we know exactly what they looked like and how big they were. It was about this big. It was literally a cracker. When I saw that, I wanted to know how big were the fish. The word fish describes a little tiny fish about the size of a minnow, so small it will fit on top of the cracker. And the way people used this was they would take one cracker, put a minnow on it, put another cracker on top, and eat it like a little sandwich. So we're talking crackers and minnows. And here's a little boy that's about to eat his snack. <laughs> and Andrew says, don't eat that. The master needs that. And now he's standing in front of Jesus. And Peter and Andrew says, Lord, oh, we finally found food, five crackers and two minnows. And then he looks at the crowd and he says, but what are they among so many? But look at the next verse. Jesus said, make the men sit down. Well, this word men's word anthropos, it describes the whole crowd. Make the whole crowd sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. Isn't that what it says? 
Jesus saw people, he saw grass, he saw food. What a great place, what a great time to have a picnic. And Jesus says, have everybody get ready, we're going to have a feast. And when you read the other gospels, he tells them to sit down by fives, twenties, tens. In other words, sit down, Jesus is organized and everything that he does. And now the disciples are instructed to prepare the crowd. Get ready, because soon food is going to be served. What do you think was going through their mind as they were telling the crowd, sit down, get ready, soon food will be served, and they know all there is is five crackers and two minnows. They were probably thinking, this is false advertisement. We are deluding. We are misleading these people. This is so wrong. They saw a crisis. Jesus saw grass. Jesus saw opportunity. And look at the next verse. I believe it's verse 11. Is it verse 11? Jesus took the loaves. Oh, this is so important because the word took in Greek is the word alaban. The tense that is used doesn't mean he took. It means Jesus received. That's important. Because Jesus will never take anything from you. He will never take a thing from you, but he will receive anything you give him. You want to hold on to your money? Hold on. You want to hold on to your talent? Hold on to your job. Hold on to your house. Hold on to your kids. Hold on to your profession. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He'll never make you give anything. But the moment you're ready to give, Jesus is always in a position to receive. And to receive, somebody had to give. It means that little boy had to let loose what was in his hands. And it passed from the hands of that little boy into the hands of Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus received the loaves and gave thanks. Everybody say, gave thanks. You get us to us. The Greek word used here describes something that freely flows out of the heart. You is the Greek word that describes something really swell, something really good. The word kerastos is from the word keros, the word grace. You put the two words together, it's free-flowing thanksgiving. It is pouring out of the heart of Jesus. He's not standing there trying to mentally multiply the loaves and the crackers in his hand. But Jesus has lifted his face toward heaven. And he begins worshiping. He's not even thinking about what's in his hand. He's not looking at what's in his hand. He's lifted his face. He's lifted his voice. And you, Kerastos, it's flowing out of him. Jesus begins worshiping and giving thanks to God. God, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are El Shaddai. He begins worshiping the Father and worshiping the Father. And we don't know how long he worshiped the Father, but it seems, if you read this text, this went on for a long time. And as long as he worshiped, The food just kept multiplying and multiplying. And this is important because, friends, when you get into an attitude of thanksgiving, the miraculous takes place. The miraculous takes place. And the Bible says he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down. The end of the verse says, as much as they, what, would which means so much food is coming out of Jesus' hands that the crowd is yelling, hey, can you bring me some more of those crackers over here? Somebody else says, hey, can we have some more of those minnows over here? And the disciples literally are working the crowd, running, taking more, taking more, taking more. And Jesus just continues blessing the Father, blessing the Father, and the food just keeps coming and keeps coming. And verse 12 says, and when they were filled, in Greek this is called pluperfect, it means doubly filled, In other words, they ate like gluttons. They are doubly filled. They're not just filled. They're holding their sides because they've eaten so much. Oh, and I have to say something else here. Jesus didn't say, you have had enough. I have already provided for you. How dare you ask me for more? There is just a limit to your asking. 
as long as they wanted, it kept coming. It just kept coming. It kept coming. It kept coming. It kept coming. It kept coming. God always overdoes everything. He has an abundant supply. The Bible says over and over, he is rich. The Greek word plusias, filthy, stinking, rich, so rich, he doesn't even know how much he has. Rich in grace, rich in mercy, rich in provision. God is overflowing. God never worries he's going to give too much. God never even thinks about that. One of the best examples is the children of Israel being fed manna in the Old Testament. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 78 that God opened a window in the heavens and manna came. Do you know that word window shows up three times in the Old Testament? Just three times. And every time the window opens, abundance comes. First time it shows up is in Genesis when God opened a window in the heavens and the rain began pouring. So much abundance of rain came through the window that it flooded the whole earth. God kind of overdid it. That's what comes through the window. Psalm 78, God opened a door, a window in the heavens, and rained. That's what it says. Just like he rained water, now he's raining manna. How much manna did he rain? How much manna do you think it rained? The rabbis, right? This is a statistic. Every day when the children of Israel woke up, every morning, every day, they were awakened to a 2,000-year supply of manna. Every day, enough for 2,000 years. If you calculate it, over all the years the manna fell, it was 67,500,000 tons of manna that came through that portal. That's a fact. God gave them more than they could even use. He wouldn't even let them take it all. But God wasn't saying, Oh my gosh, we're going to have a shortage of manna in heaven. Oh my gosh, I've given too much manna. What in the world have I done? God was not concerned about overdoing it. You know the third time the window shows up? Malachi chapter 3, when God says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse and see not if I will open a window in the heavens and pour out a blessing so big you will not have room enough to receive it. To understand that window, you got to go back to the first window and the second window, and you understand that when God says he's going to bless a tither, he doesn't mean a drip here and a drip there. He means he is going to flood you with a supply so that you won't even know what to do with it. That's the nature of God. He's just a giver. And my God shall do what? Supply all your need according to his plusias, filthy, stinking, immeasurable riches. He's got more than we can imagine. And now Jesus is not saying, you guys have already had enough. How dare you ask for more? He just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying until finally the people are laying on their sides they can't eat anymore. And he has so overdone it that there are fragments and crackers laying between the blades of the grass. So Jesus says, gather up the fragments that remain, which tells us he's also economical. He never wastes anything. He is a Jew. <laughs> and the Bible says they filled 12 baskets full. Well, Pastor John, Jan, what would be the odds? What would be the odds that there were 12 disciples and just happened to be 12 baskets? Well, the word basket is the same Greek word in the New Testament that was normally used for a piece of suitcase. These disciples were not expecting they were going to have to pick up fragments that day. Jesus said, gather up the fragments that remained. They didn't have anything but their suitcases. So they dumped out their clothes, took what they had, and begin picking up the fragments that remain. And I like that because Jesus will use anything that you have. He doesn't care what you have. If you'll give it, he'll use it. And there's something else I love about this. Mm. <sighs> While all the people were eating, 
What were the disciples doing? Serving. Running here, running there. They didn't eat anything. They're just working, 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 working. But at the end of the day, Jesus made sure that those who volunteered were taken care of. And that's also true in your church, in your church, in any church. Those who volunteer in the parking lot, in the children's ministry, might feel like they're being left out. But hey, Jesus always takes care of those that volunteer. He always takes care of them. Look at the final verse. Then those men, those men, it's talking about the disciples. The disciples who had already seen all these miracles, when they saw this miracle, when they saw that miracle which Jesus did, they said, surely this is that prophet that should come into the world. This experience took them higher in their faith. It gave them a new revelation. Wow. And that's why you need Jesus to ask you to do something new. You need him to ask you a question. Because it will take you up a notch. When you've seen him heal, you have a revelation that he's the healer. When you see him deliver, you have a revelation that he's the deliverer. When you see him work a financial miracle, it brings you up in your faith. Every event, every challenge, it makes you stop and say, wow, God is amazing. But I'm going to end with this. Who was most amazed? I think it was the little boy. They were his crackers. He knew where this started. And when he walked through the crowd and saw people holding their sides and complaining they had eaten too much, and he saw all his crackers laying in the blades of grass all over the place and disciples picking up baskets and baskets and baskets that remained, he could have literally said, you know, those were my crackers. <laughs> and my final word is nobody understands a miracle like those where it originated. When you started with nothing, now you have everything. Nobody understands like you do. Yesterday, Denise and I were with friends. Maybe he's here tonight. Back when they had a truck driving business, we were friends. I remember. Today, they have a company with hundreds and hundreds of employees. All those employees get paid. They're eating. They're blessed. They're eating their crackers. They're eating their fish. They just don't know where it came from. Like the founders know, they know where this thing started. What a privilege to be a part of a miracle. Denise and I, we're living a miracle right now. Our life is really a miracle. And there's not a day that we're not amazed by the goodness of God. We're just amazed by God's goodness. Because we never forgot where this started. Now, the little boy could have eaten his crackers. They were his. Jesus wouldn't have judged him. You know what would have happened? He would have swallowed them, digested them, gone to the toilet, and that would be the history of the crackers. <laughs> they would end up in the sewer. But because he gave and Jesus received... That little boys who we're talking about tonight. His crackers made history. What's in your hand? What's in your hand that Jesus is asking for? He'll never take it. He'll never take it. But he's ready to receive it. 
And when it leaves your hand and enters into his hand, you have entered into another dimension. What's he asking you tonight? It's good that he's asking. I want you to bow your heads. I want to pray for you. Tomorrow night's going to be totally different. But tonight I wanted you to see Jesus and feel Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your questions that change our lives. Lord, tonight we look at what's in our hands. As long as it's in our hands, Lord, it'll be what it is. Lord, there are people in this room tonight willing to give, and you're ready to receive. I pray, Father, for tonight people to release their families, release their employment, release their money, release their dreams. Jesus, we ask you to receive. Receive it, Lord. Multiply it. We thank you that you are still the Lord of multiplication. You are the Lord of multiplication. We ask you to multiply, multiply. Just raise your hands to him right now and just say, Father, we give it all to you. Anything you want from me, I surrender it to you this night. If you've asked, it's yours. Help us to quickly warm up to saying yes. Take us into a higher realm. Take us into a new revelation. We thank you for it. In the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Pastor Jan.